And we are live. Welcome to the New York Information Security Meetup. We are a few minutes late, but that's uh, that's okay. You know, we're uh, you know since uh, these are live events, uh, you know things happen, and we had some issues with the link. Uh, but I'm glad we managed to uh, make this work. I'm very very excited to introduce Val Bekovici, who is the uh, Chainkit uh, founder and chief executive officer. Um, and you know, I would love to to talk about uh, embarking on a journey to create something new. Uh, talk about uh, talk shop about cybersecurity in general, and um, just get a feel about uh, you know uh, blockchain technologies, <laughs> NFTs, and so on. And you're laughing already, so this is going to be a great conversation. So Val, welcome. Thank you very much for joining. Oh, it's a pleasure to finally be on, David. <laughs> so why don't we get started from the beginning? Um, you and I met uh, on a uh, rooftop patio years ago. You were an executive at a very, uh, you know, prestigious company, uh, you, you know, doing quite well. And so I wanted to start kind of like from maybe before that and kind of walk us through why you decided to jump into the deep end and, uh, you know, and, and create your own company. <laughs> Uh, the short answer is I get bored easily. And so that's, you know, oscillating between working on large enterprises and working at small startups is something that keeps me intellectually motivated and interested. And, uh, and that's, you know, one of the big reasons why I decided to go ahead and, um, and jump into the, the fray here. Now, um, you were... Were you always in tech? What was like, kind of your first, you know, couple of roles, and how did you get into like, you know, the kind of thick of of cybersecurity? <clears throat> yeah, so that, it, it started with like a simple thing when I when I was first, you know, my first hack. Everyone I likes to ask, you know, what was your first hack? For me, it was a kid in Montreal, you know, playing around with sending people letters for free. So literally knowing that within you know one post office region, all you had to do was swap the deliver to address and the sender address and you're able to send people sometimes pretty heavy letters and packages for free that was sort of my first hack and that was my thinking a, around you know it's almost like a physical hack <laughs> it, yeah it's a physical hack you know at the time you know steve jobs and then wozniak were doing the phone freaking thing i was just sending letters and packages for free but uh <laughs> nevertheless that made me realize obviously that you could hack systems and then once that was when PCs were beginning to take off as well. And I remember my first job wasn't working for the government, but it was a contractor to the government. And I just, you know, was working in databases. I was a DBA. So working on ledgers and just realizing how much information could be transparently shared because everything, of course, is on a ledger, particularly an electronic ledger nowadays how much information could be shared, how much more transparent we could be, and of course, how easy and, and regular it is to either cover that information up or worse, manipulate it and tamper with it. And um, that, that realization never left my mind in terms of the power, people controlling databases, and specifically the DBAs and the people they work for, the power they had, the control over information, and as I progressed through my career, I definitely went deep into becoming, you know, uh, an expert in Oracle and Sybase and, and Microsoft SQL Server. Then deep, obviously, where we met into the data center storage and data management landscape. Uh, it never escaped me that, you know, the power that people have over information and the unchecked power people still have today over either restricting or manipulating and tampering with the AI term as poisoning, you know, data and information that is still unchecked that still happens with impunity today which is really sad given that it's many decades later uh and that's clearly a, an opportunity to improve you know, society and, and business yeah and also what's interesting about this is that um you know we are becoming more and more dependent on technology as well as data uh, you know, we're a knowledge-based economy. Everything is knowledge. You know, people, even the brick-and-mortar uh, businesses out there are, you know, based, uh, you know, have, have a lot of, like, data that flows, and they're, they're getting the competitive edge not necessarily from, you know, doing something slightly better, um, you know, from a physical perspective, but it's part of the kind of the process, the data they collect, what you know, what they do with it, and so on. Um, so, so you could have, you know, you could have continued that journey, 
you know, uh, becoming an executive and making great, you know, great money and some established business. So what made you, uh, you know, jump in and uh, basically create your own business? Uh, so walk me through that, that logic. Uh, it's really simple, you know, for those of us that have spent enough time in, in corporate, you know, environments and enterprise, you realize that after a while, you know, the you, you kind of the, the joke, I think, in government and in military is you get promoted to your level of incompetence. And, you know, <laughs> I, I got to a point where I was everything I was doing had very little direct connection to technology. You know, it was all it was a lot of management meetings. Right. My, my last gig uh, helping integrate the largest ever acquisition by NetApp of SolidFire and right? helping integrate SolidFire was really my job, my main job. And it was done at the executive level. It was done, obviously, from a technology enablement perspective and so forth, a CTO. But nevertheless, it wasn't really a CTO. It wasn't really an engineering. It wasn't a product creation job. And at the same time, I was doing a lot of management things this Cambrian explosion of machine learning and blockchain was happening. And clearly, as I dove into those, I could see nothing but data management and security problems, which is what inspired me to, to start Pencil Data. Uh, so, and Pencil Data is our legal name, by the way, for ChainKit, the product. Oh, is it? Okay. So so you brought in the B word, you know, the, the, B -word, block, yeah. the blockchain. Yeah. Now, you know, it's amazing because, um, you know, I've, I've come across uh, – companies in this space, you know, years ago. And, you know, we, we were talking about specifically about, you know, offloading a lot of the decentralized, uh, you know, databases and so on onto the blockchain and the properties of a blockchain. So for the people that are not, so I like to, you know, my audience is, you know, combines from like people that are, you know, deep, knee deep into cybersecurity, understand all this stuff, but also mm -hmm. newcomers. So if you don't mind, give us a, a quick overview of what a blockchain is and then we can jump into like you know chain kit specifically and you know what problems do you do you solve that'd be phenomenal yeah i mean at the highest level and i, I love the way we started the conversation about you know ledgers and and transparency at the highest level a blockchain is nothing more than a truly open censorship resistance that's the key part public ledger which means that you can see every transaction on there and you don't have to trust yourself or some kind of other designated third party that certainly may or may not have a, a motivation sometime down there to tamper with the information. It's a group or it's a consensus trust. It's objective, right? It's fact versus opinion. And so the ability to have these public ledgers where a bank or a government can't censor, tamper with, or, or otherwise manipulate a transaction that is a powerful, powerful construct, and we're only beginning to see, you know, people tap into the value of that uh, with some of the headline announcements over time. But that's what drew me to blockchain at the highest level is literally what drew me into technology at the beginning of my career, which is why, when information is recorded, is it so hard to just get it back authentically? Now, uh, is it really? Is there really? Um... And tampered with uh, because I mean, look at the uh, what happened just recently uh, that the government, U.S. government, managed to recover some you know yeah. Bitcoin, which is based on like, on blockchain technology um, or or blockchain technology based on on cryptocurrency. But uh, the they managed to get it back. So is it really that you know private? Is it really anything private these days? And then, like let's take a the rabbit hole there. Yeah, it's a good rabbit hole. It's a, yeah. it's an important rabbit hole. Yeah. It's timely and topical. So we don't want to confuse or conflate privacy with transparency. Okay. And what happened with the FBI retrieving part, you know, most of the ransom paid, uh, this was a colonial pipeline one, I think, right? There's so many yes, nowadays. Exactly. Losing, losing track. So the <laughs> colonial pipeline ransom payment, that is a perfect example of exactly what is going on in the blockchain space today. On the one hand, there's a perception that blockchain is completely anonymous. And that any transaction on there is totally private and secure through obscurity, right? And any in any cybersecurity information security professional will tell you there's really no such thing as security through obscurity. That's not something you want to depend on for your own privacy or security anymore. Uh, and so what we're realizing now through really great examples like this is that, yeah, blockchain has a way to absolutely record the integrity. That's really a key concept. The integrity of a transaction 
prevent a double spend, make sure that money went from A to B, and we can guarantee effectively that it went from A to B. We may not know who A or B is. And that's the other key part of this story that's wonderful is that blockchain is mostly transparent. And depending on which blockchain you choose, Bitcoin being the prime example, it's not entirely anonymous or private anymore. Just because some of the core concepts, some of the core private keys and public keys and wallet addresses being used are just these random you know, hexadecimal numbers, this long string of hexadecimal numbers, doesn't mean that you can't analyze the public transactions on a public ledger. And this, the, the initial step that both the FBI, the U.S. Secret Service, lots of law enforcement organizations working with the DOJ, the initial step they conduct is they do a lot of analysis, particularly in a criminal context, a lot of analysis of the transactions. And if you've had big data discussions before, you know, big data analytics is really powerful. The more data you have to triangulate with, you know, the more you can narrow down exactly what's going on and perhaps who A or B are. And I'm happy to explain exactly, you know, how the FBI went, went about obtaining something that was thought to be impossible, which are the private keys to the wallet in question. But it just shows you that, you know, blockchain is all these things. It gives you some level of anonymity and privacy, but not full. And certainly um, the public transparent ledger nature of it all means that all activity can be tracked, whether it's benign or malicious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, it's also true that, you know, the way the cryptocurrency works, you have to offload, it, uh, you know, you know, sometimes to the, to the exchange and back. And then, you know, it's only really secure when you put it on a, your, you know, private, um, quote unquote, private, uh, uh, you know, like a, a key or, or you know, wallet. Yeah, private can, wallet with yeah. your own keys. You know, yeah. I can at a high level breakdown because the story is really, it, it, they're, they're going to make a movie about this or at least an episode of NCIS. But what happened here in question, to the best of our knowledge of all the expert research, was that as the dark side, and one of their affiliates in question here was collecting ransom from Colonial Pipeline. The crypto markets and Bitcoin in particular was crashing. Mm -hmm. So they had demanded something like $5 million, right? I think they were paid $11 million. I'm sorry, I forget about the 5 million number. They were paid $11 million ultimately. They probably demanded mm -hmm. a lot more and got negotiated down. That's another conversation. And of the $11 million, the affiliate got a little, well, got a very greedy. Because they were realizing that if I hang on to this Bitcoin a little longer, maybe the markets will recover and it'll be worth $11 million versus <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, right? Five by the time it was retrieved, literally. So A, the affiliate got greedy and sloppy, and that's their critical mistake, their lethal mistake. B, they decided eventually to liquidate, right? Eventually to try and cash out even at literally half, half the value of, of the ransom they collected. And in order to do that, what most people don't realize is that the same old rules of money laundering and money mules and things like that, you know, apply to cryptocurrency and Bitcoin as it does to cash. And you need to launder this money, you know, if you really want to be able to collect it without getting all sorts of other regulatory oversight from from banking and, and law mm -hmm. enforcement agencies. And to do that, there's these services called mixers. And what this particular affiliate did was use a, here's a, the, the suspicion, this is on, not 100% confirmed yet, but it's the best expert analysis. One of these mixers was actually a fake FBI sting operation. You know, perhaps the, all, of, all of the mixers in question in this particular case. And that's how, you know, the FBI didn't use quantum computing to somehow break Bitcoin or break cryptography as we know it. And they didn't do anything, you know, too sophisticated or science fiction in terms of doing this, they literally set up uh, a front for a money laundering, crypto money laundering organization, and they were <laughs> transferred. The funds were transferred to this service, which was under their jurisdiction physically. So somewhere in you under US jurisdiction, the server that was hosting this wallet that may have been on a public exchange like Coinbase or Kraken or not, may have not, but the server, including, of course, the keys were not held in private the way you're supposed to uh, in, in a best practice, private ledger, private wallet context in, in, in cryptocurrencies. It was on a public ledger. Someone else, a cloud provider effectively was managing those keys. And because that cloud provider was under FBI jurisdiction, they were able to issue you know, a court order. 
and sees that server sees the keys. And so, it, you know, when you think about it, some very old school tactics, including sting operations, were used in these very new technology environments to be able to, you know, a, a get the money back, which is a great story. And unfortunately, it's mostly symbolic. Uh, this is not a pattern or a trend <laughs> we can expect you in know, the future unless we run into very stupid criminals. Yeah, it's amazing. The same rules apply. And, uh, you know, it's and kudos to the FBI. I mean, it's just, uh, didn't they create also a, a mobile app that was supposed to allow people to communicate uh, anonymously and they use that to, to uh, take down the, uh, quite the operation? So people download it thinking that they're anonymously, you know, having conversations, but it was... It was uh, it was all you know, it was basically held by the FBI. The FBI developed it and posted it. So it was very, really very curious that that, that <laughs> announcement was released the same day, because <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it connects a lot of dots for people, right? You have to be clandestine. You know, I guess you always had to be clandestine in law enforcement to catch criminals, and now they're just being digitally clandestine. So yeah, that anonymous messaging, you know, application is the exact same strategy, which is set up a sting operation. <laughs> And, you know, fool the bad guys into trusting you and then catch them through that mis misplaced trust. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a it's a great win, you know, for, uh, you know, for the protectors in this particular case. Uh, so let's jump into uh, Chain Kit, you know, and what is the kind of the number one problem you solve as a company um, in because you come from from a slightly different angle that wasn't, uh, you know, ex explored so far. And you're leveraging uh, a technology that's fairly new, and you're looking to solve a very, very big problem. Um, so uh, maybe you walk me through the kind of the process of, of creating the business. And again, just from, from the start, from an idea, because ideas are dime, dime a dozen. People have ideas, and we can go in and have a beer and you know, have a bunch of ideas on a napkin. But then creating, you know, creating the fabric around it, you know, you have people working with you now. You're raising funds, the whole process. So walk me through that, through that process of creating a product. Right. So I think, you know, we um, we have to be honest with ourselves as technical founders. The proper way to start a business is to find a business problem and then come up with a solution for it. The way most Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley businesses, startups work and technical founders such as myself and Kumar, my co-founder, is that we fall in love with a technology and then we try and find the problem that the technology solves. And it turned out that, you know, the, the joke is, do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? Uh, you know, technical founders want to be right first <laughs> before they want to be rich. And we have spent, you know, one year developing this technology and then two years bringing it to market. But effectively, the solution to what is now a well-recognized problem, the solution was blockchain provides unquestionably, there's no debute or, uh, d dispute or debate about this, the best integrity environment, the best integrity networks on the planet. There's literally billions, uh, trillions with a T, trillions of dollars at stake, depending on the mathematical cryptographic integrity of blockchain networks. So we figured, you know, this is a novel thing. The accessibility to this kind of objective integrity uh, has, you know, tamper proof, if you will, has really just never been available before. So Kumar and I fell in love with the ability to bring that integrity to market. And we tried to figure out where is it valued, where is it monetized? And as we kept talking to more people, learning more, we realized that this wasn't just a general business thing. You know, that may happen in the future, but executives don't wake up in the morning thinking, how can I buy more integrity for my business? You know, it, it's a concept. It's an aspiration. It's not a product right now. But cybersecurity professionals do. And particularly experienced ones that have that adversarial thinking so it's literally around you know does your mind think in ways you can hack systems or not because ransomware operators and in, in cyber espionage attackers and so forth they do wake up every morning thinking of new and novel ways to hack systems and to tamper with systems and the one thing that is missing in cybersecurity today in terms of being generally and widely available is not better encryption we have great encryption we have great, you know, identity management and key management systems for confidentiality, one third of all cybersecurity. Uh, we have great backup solutions and we have great, you know, data replication and archiving solutions. So availability, confidentiality and availability are well served parts of the cybersecurity market. But the third and final critical pillar of cybersecurity is the cross-examination of those two. 
of confidentiality and availability. And that is the I, integrity. When we often refer to this as a triad, the CIA triad, nothing to do with Central Intelligence Agency, all about confidentiality, integrity, and availability in a triad. And the underserved, unloved part of this industry is integrity. We take it for granted. We make the fatal assumption and flaw that encryption equals integrity. And it does. I think the headlines prove it doesn't, or else we wouldn't have a ransomware problem. We wouldn't have a cyber espionage problem because we have great encryption everywhere. We have great identity management everywhere. It's not nearly enough. Cyber criminals know how to get around encryption by not attacking it head on, but by stealing keys, uh, you know, through identity vulnerabilities and so forth. They certainly know how to just delete backups. So availability is not foolproof. But when you have all three working together with integrity in the mix, you can now detect all this adversarial activity. You can detect, you know, key theft and compromise and tampering. You can detect certainly identity compromise and tampering. Uh, you can absolutely detect when someone's messing with your backups and your archives or your mirrors. And it's those three working in harmony is what ultimately delivers true security. Uh, and there isn't enough integrity and there's certainly not enough automated integrity uh, in the mix today. And that's fundamentally what we realize is Chainkit's core value is being able to automate integrity for the 21st century because the first and only product still used commercially today is a 30 year old product called Tripwire, which was a great technology for the client server era. But we live in this world called cloud today. We live uh, in, in pipelines. All data is streaming today in a pipeline. All code is being developed and updated continuously today in a pipeline. All machine learning, AI, is happening in a data and, and code and, and sorry, a data and model pipeline. And so it's the ability to keep up with the changes to information over a pipeline that is the missing piece of cybersecurity today. It's very fundamental. Uh, and again, takes some time to explain to people, but once they get it, they realize why Chainkit is a foundational, you know, part of cybersecurity. Um, so fascinating. So where do you sit? Like, you know, so what, uh, you know, particular, what type of, of um, you know, pipeline or services does the organization need to protect? And, you know, how do you solve the kind of scalability problem? You know, I, I remember like in the past, we we're talking about how blockchain technology has, uh, has some limitations in terms of how long it takes to write to the ledger and how long it takes to, to pull that information out. Uh, so how did you solve those those problems? And, uh, you know, if, if you know, I was somebody that I'm listening to this, this uh, you know, event right now and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing. How, you know, how can I potentially leverage this type of technology in my organization? What that process would look like? Yeah, great question. And we, we basically approach this incredibly pragmatically and simply. So today there's a, you know, we have a, a simple concept like the CIA triad. And we have sort of the application of concepts like that. Uh, one of the most popular frameworks in cybersecurity is NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, CSF, the Cybersecurity Framework. It's a five-step framework. It starts with, you know, very unglamorous but necessary things like doing an inventory of all your digital assets, all your laptops, all your apps, all your networks and devices and so forth. You know, and so after you do that, you basically, if you identify your assets, you protect your assets. Then you detect any threats against those assets. And then two key parts, which unfortunately are the hottest parts of cybersecurity today, are responding to the incidents, responding to the attacks, responding to the ransomware demand, and recovering. So those five steps, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Every organization that I know strategically plans left to right. So let's start with identify, then graduate and move to protect, then graduate and move you know, to detect, and then historically it was call firefighters from outside the organization to respond and recover. People are bringing that in house right now because response and recovery due to the ransomware epidemic is a regular thing right now. There's seven public ransomware attacks declared in the US every hour. Think about that. And then behind the scenes, uh, there's speculation that there's 10 or 50 more that we don't read about. So response and recovery is no longer, you know, uh, a firefighting context of occasionally there's a fire. Occasionally you call a fire department in. You need an in-house fire department, basically. 
but everyone strategically plans left to right. And the fun thing about, you know, thinking um, as it, like an Israeli, for example, and reading right to left is that's how adversaries think. So adversaries, the first thing they do is they know you're going to try and, you know, particularly ransomware actors, affiliates and operators, they know you're going to try and recover from the ransomware. So the very first thing they do backwards is attack your recovery. That's called, you know, um, counter incident response or anti forensic techniques that mm -hmm. not be detected. So attack the backups first, then attack your ability to respond quickly and be organized in your response. They want to create chaos and panic to drive up urgency for paying the ransom. So working backwards through the CSF is literally how your adversary works in a cybersecurity context and an infosec context. And if you understand that, that's a fundamental thing to really understand. Experience brings that over time and people do that. Then you realize that integrity is the most important thing. Because if you don't know whether your backups are valid or not, Mm -hmm. And and where we started specifically wasn't even just backups. It was something that's even a more critical part of every incident response, the logs. Everything comes down to the logs. The logs are the final arbiter of truth as to what happened and how you can maybe analyze them proactively to prevent bad things from happening. But most importantly, know where you are in a crisis and know which way to go to respond and recover from the crisis. If those logs are somehow missing or corrupt, you have just now gone, you know, from the outside of a volcano where it's lethally hot to inside the volcano where you have instant death. So this is the, the core problem that we're attacking right now. And you would be surprised at how long it takes to explain the importance of this to people. But the core problem right now is log integrity. People don't know what they have. People don't know what's missing or worse tampered with as they're in crisis mode in their war rooms responding to ransomware attacks. And therefore, it takes so much longer than it has to to respond, to work with law enforcement, to decide whether to pay the $11 million ransom right now or whether you actually have the ability to not do that, to delay the decision or, the, or eliminate the payment altogether. If you don't have good information, if you don't have you know integrity in your logs, uh, you're in a world of hurt right now. And what's critical is that this has now become completely recognized. This is something that was an mm -hmm. academic debate even a year ago, where it should never have been. But May 12th, the White House issued a cybersecurity executive order, big, big public policy mm -hmm. document with a lot of policy direction. And what was surprising to me is within a high level policy document, they got super specific in one section and said, you will no longer just encrypt your logs and keep your logs. You will verify the integrity of your logs. That's a mandate now. And I was just so relieved to see that because finally some true cyber experts are involved in setting policy and, and they put that down on paper, you know, in black and white for everyone to read as opposed to have academic debates about whether it's really necessary or not. But hold on, Val. Like, aren't they like the companies that are generating these logs, you know, their services, aren't they like checking to a checksum and, and make sure that the logs are not tampered with, you know, it sounds almost like trivial, no? I love the question and uh, I hate to be chuckling because this is a very serious thing, but the simple answer is no. You know, uh, we put so much implicit trust, the opposite of zero trust in our own security systems. Look at SolarWinds and how much trust was put in that software, misplaced trust was put in that software. Uh, and look at the whole concept of encryption is enough. If I encrypt my logs, surely there's integrity in there because you know the you can only you know get out what you put in with regards to encryption. And so most people believe that by encrypting their logs at rest and perhaps even encrypting the network connections from the Windows laptop, forwarding logs to a log collector, let's you know pick Splunk because they've been really good in, in public about this. You would think that's enough, and, and that's not at all the case. So Splunk is a great example for a number of reasons. They're the market leader. They've invested a lot of effort into you know, helping their customers stay secure. And six years ago, in 2015, they publicly identified in a blog and a product announcement that their customers were seeing their logs getting tampered with by cyber attackers, by adversaries. And so only, only six years ago, Splunk leading the industry said, we will add, because it wasn't there before, 
integrity checking into the logs. So that's a good news. You know, finally, that feature, that capability, I think it was Splunk 6.0 or 6.1 or something, uh, was finally in the product. The bad news is it's a very difficult thing to verify integrity of something that's always changing. And so the way that Splunk productized and the way their customers operationalize this is effectively it's an offline feature. So you've got to take your systems down to check for integrity periodically. <coughs> and worse than that, you've got to trust that the, the hashes, that's the cryptographic function used to periodically verify the integrity of things. You've got to check that the hashes themselves haven't been tampered with and you can only use simple database mechanisms to hope that those hashes that you took last week that you're comparing for validation this week are still the same and you haven't really you know had someone tamper with the hashes which is of course what happened right away because adversaries read blogs too uh, and so the operationalization of this product feature never really happened in the industry because it's a hard problem and it wasn't solved really until we came around and realized the online continuous integrity the objective trillion dollar integrity of blockchain solves this problem because now you can protect those hashes with the trillion dollars of market value on a public blockchain or a private one if you choose it's a little less secure but it's still much more than a database or a file system and if you do it correctly the way chainkit does you can do it in real time so you're not taking systems offline and periodically verifying their integrity you're verifying the integrity of your, in this case, log analytic systems continuously in real time, all the time, which gives you the ability to not only have updated information when you're in crisis mode during incident response and forensic investigation and recovery, but since it's automatic in real time, you can be proactive and catch the tampering, you know, in the act in real time, which is an unheard of capability right now. And most people can't even wrap their heads around that. Yeah, so it's a hard problem, but it's also a universal problem. You know, if you only, you know, decided that Chainkit will be protecting, you know, a fraction of the logs worldwide for, you know, the Fortune 100, uh, you should be doing all right, you know, in terms of uh, you just need to, to get to that point. Um, so, you know, prior to this conversation, we somehow got to NFTs. And I would love to, to jump into that because, you know, we, we I'd love to, maybe we can do another session just about that too. But why don't we uh, talk a bit about that because you dabble in that as well. Um, and first of all, before we start again, like if you don't mind just uh, providing a, just a, a very brief overview of what, what NFTs are. And even though like it's one of the hottest, you know, uh, um, kind of topics these days um, you know blockchain is kind of like the old school like nfts are kind of the new school and then how how did you get involved in that and um you know what's what's your goal in, in kind of you know doing the uh, the nft uh, side of the house that'd be great yeah so I'm, I'm going to misplace it but that gandhi quote applies here you know initially to blockchain <laughs> years ago and to nfts today first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you then you win <laughs> so that was happening with blockchain in the enterprise, even in security about four or five years ago. People thought it was a joke and it's no longer a joke. It's pretty hardcore right now. The exact same thing cycle is happening with NFTs. People mock them to death. Uh, they don't really understand them, but I don't blame them because it's a, it's a shocking concept, right? So I, I like to start the description with the headline I think we all read. It was like March 12th of this year. Uh, a very savvy investor in Singapore paid $69 million, I'll repeat that, $69 million for a JPEG file, right? That you could, you and I can download anytime right now for free. So everyone says, this is the stupidest thing in the world, NFTs. It make no sense to me whatsoever. Let's talk about something else. And they're completely missing the point. The reason why uh, the guy's handle is Metacoven, the investor, why he paid that you know, outrageous amount of money for a JPEG file. It's the same reason Paul Simon recently sold the rights to his music to one of the big studios, you know, one of the big musical studios for $300 million. You and I can download every Paul Simon song ever recorded for free, anytime, all the time, anywhere. So why is that worth $300 million? Because the ownership, the digital rights now, in particular to something, particularly when it's popular and it has value, is valuable. And 
right now, the, the, the authenticity of Paul Simon's music is a piece of papers and legal documents right now. That's where it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's photocopies and there's Xeroxes of them and there's faxes of them. But it's a very weak system in terms of the provenance and lineage of ownership. NFTs are cheap relative to that. And they're ubiquitous. And they're, they are a way to prove the provenance of something. The objective always comes back to that integrity, the objective provenance of something, whether you own it, whether a transaction happened or not. And the lineage. Where did it start? Where is it now? Where can it be going? How can you resell this or license this or everything? So we've heard the con the term smart contracts before, which is actually a very good term. It's literally the, the codification of legalese in a contract into computer code so that it's objectively and consistently enforced 24-7 all the time. You don't need a lawyer or a notary to execute this. It's just codified. NFTs are the simplest form of a smart contract today. And they make a lot of sense even for where they're popular today, which is the highly curated world of art, digital art or tokenization of art in particular, collectibles, so NBA top shots, just like baseball cards, trading cards, mm -hmm. Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh cards and all that. Collectibles is another hot area for NFTs, <coughs> but those are all going to be dwarfed by the third category. Third category is called utility NFTs. And guess what? That's what Chainkit's been doing from day one for Splunk and other you know, security analytics environments is literally saying, Every log line needs to have provenance now because it's critical when an incident happens and for forensics. And we need the lineage of that. We need to know where did this log start? Did it start on a Windows laptop or somewhere else? Was it manipulated first on a laptop or on the network or on the Splunk server? So that, that core capability that an NFT provides works for business transactions, for messaging, for property you know, rights and land titles and certificates. It works everywhere in business. It's at all not restricted to art. Mm -hmm. And here's one example. So our, our big public reference customer is Broadcom, the global semiconductor manufacturer. They're, by the way, in your pocket or on your desk right now because they're in every mobile phone that's shipping. And of course, being a large company, a global manufacturer, <coughs> they get lots of logs, lots of security incidents, as they're called security events. And they've quantified that. It's four, it peaks at 4 billion per hour of security events in, in those log files from all over the world. And they knew somewhere in that big data set lies tampering, lies a problem, but they could never narrow it down. And so before it had a name, before we knew what we were calling it, we were delivering 4 billion NFTs per hour at a fraction of a cost of an NFT today to Broadcom. Mm -hmm for their Splunk system, for their logs. And, uh, and that's just, I think, a great example of how far NFTs can go, is being a core principle, a pillar of cyber, one of the three pillars of cybersecurity integrity, objective integrity with provenance and lineage uh, at any pace and any volume that's necessary for cybersecurity today. You know, absolutely fascinating. So just another, you know, term uh, that people throw around, but it's, uh, you know, I, we, you know, fast forward a couple of years from now, it is going to be ubiquitous, just like blockchain. And um, we're finding more and more um, applications that be used and so on. So where do you go from here? You're in, um, you know, you're looking for customers. If somebody wants to reach out to you and, you know, give it a try, um, what's kind of the best use case right now for it? Um, and who do you see as your perfect uh, candidate for, for something like this? So if I'm talking to my traditional audience, the enterprise buyer, particularly cybersecurity folks working either with or inside a security operations center, a SOC, or folks working with their managed security provider that operates that for them, uh, we definitely have to start complying with mandates from the executive order. Those, by the way, have been part of regular IT cybersecurity audits like the ISO 27001, NIST 800-53-207 now and others. So these have been in the vernacular of the insiders, the industry insiders for some time, but it's rising and rising now in terms of urgency and, and criticality and priority. Mm -hmm. So if you're involved with security operation centers, you need now to comply more than ever and not accept the risk of maybe there's tampering, maybe there's not, but say I need to detect it. You need to 
put, you know, we call it wrapping chains of custody around your logs. It's just a necessary thing right now. It used to be optional. You used to be able to dance around it. Auditors aren't accepting it anymore. And this very public White House, you know, executive order basically is mandating it for all government and all businesses that work with government. So that's job number one is look at your logs. Maybe it's Splunk. Maybe it's Elasticsearch, IBM Q Radar, Microsoft Sentinel now in the cloud. There's plenty of logging environments out there right now. You can no longer take the integrity of those things for granted the way you have. So that's that's job number one. The second thing is, you know, if I am delivering any kind of dashboard to my frontline workers to help them transact with customers, or especially to, you know, to my executives that are making million, billion dollar strategic mm -hmm. decisions based on dashboards, Excel reports, Power BI, Tableau, you know, Looker, et cetera. Uh, it's time to start taking the integrity of that data and information presented seriously. Because today, without verifying, without zero trust for your data, which is how we operate, unfortunately, today, maybe we do zero trust for our passwords and identities. We're not doing it for our data yet. Mm -hmm. If you don't know where your data is coming from, if you don't know, so it's coming from S3 or Kafka, if you want to get technical nowadays. Uh, very often now it's being analyzed on something like Snowflake, white hot you know, data analytics platform in the cloud. And then it's being presented to Tableau, to Power BI, to Excel. If you don't know the provenance and lineage of that data through those two or three simple steps to get to your dashboard, you literally cannot trust what you're looking at. The president of the United States today in the dashboards he's looking at cannot be assured by the NSA that that information is 100% accurate because the ability to tamper with it what we call monkey in the middle, to be politically correct now, we don't call it man in the middle attacks anymore. Those are rife and easy in between all the points where encryption stops and restarts. You can insert yourself as an attacker. This is what happened with SolarWinds. This is how the IRS emails got compromised, Department of Commerce, Treasury, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, ironically, DHS, you know, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, all these organizations got compromised by the SolarWinds attackers, not because they didn't have encryption or good password management and 2FA, MFA. It's because those endpoints of terminating encryption as we transform data from a source to analytics to presentation, those encryption endpoints terminate and restart. And in the middle, you compromise a host, you compromise a system, and you can tamper with the integrity with full impunity for about mm -hmm. two years, as we've seen right now. Yeah, it's amazing. And how you know, how can you make a decision on based on, you know, data that's being presented that you don't have the uh, the knowledge of its integrity? But that's the broad market, you know, is yeah. basically, hey, anyone that deals with IT is mm -hmm. taking the integrity of their data for and their information to their executives, for example, for granted right now. And uh, when you put it that way, and it can't be disputed. That's when people, you know, the light goes on and they realize this is a, a, a either a future crisis we've been lucky to not face yet, or ransomware is showing us exactly how that can be exploited against us. So, how do we, uh, you know, how do people get a hold of you? What's the best way? Easy, you know, go to our website. You know, uh, send us an email, sales or info at chainkit.com. We're pretty prolific on Twitter and LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can text us if you really want, but. But it's easier to just start, obviously, with some uh, you know other electronic communications, and then uh, we're more than happy to engage. That's awesome. So Val, you know, I, I wish we had a little bit more time, but you know, listen, I uh, I love for, to host you in New York. Things are starting to pick up. Uh, we're opening up uh, the physical events. Uh, I'm hoping the next one is August third uh, in New York City. And uh, but regardless, you know, so you you're always invited. And hopefully, we'll. Thank we'll you. find a rooftop uh, in New York City. Those are big now uh, these days. We have another we, another half of the year to fill. Uh, I'll make it this year for sure. Yeah, so that'd be awesome. And then uh, I highly recommend to uh, to follow your work. Um, again, you're a visionary in the space. Uh, it's not easy to to create uh, something new, but you have, as you mentioned, you have a big problem, and timing is is right. I mean, I think all the all the stars are aligned to to take care of this particular issue. Uh, and we've seen that uh, before. So sometimes it's timing and circumstance when, you, uh, when you're when you talking about uh, winning in business. Uh, so Val, thank you very much for joining. Thanks all for joining and, and looking forward to uh, seeing you at the uh, next event. Take care all. Thank, thank you for you. hosting me, David. This is fun. Thank you.